Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second day of the fourth annual Canadian Muslim Mental Health Conference. My name is Dr. Huda Ali Marty. I'm a third year psychiatry resident at McMaster University, and I am also the community lead of the Canadian Muslim Mental Health Conference Committee. Before I introduce our next speaker for the day, I have a few announcements to make. Um, please note that at the end of the conference, you will be receiving um, a couple of uh, Google survey forms. One will be for feedback. We would appreciate your feedback and your input. We are always looking to improve for the next uh, conference, inshallah. And if you also would, are interested in receiving accreditation hours, please complete that Google form as well in order to receive your accreditation. If you see a resource during our resource fair that you're interested in, I would like to address you to our website at muslimmentalhealth.ca, where you will find a comprehensive list of community resources addressing Muslim mental health across Canada on our website. Um, for those that are listening to our sessions, if you have any questions, I would like to please uh, point you to our Q&A box. Um, please post your answers there and we will um, address them, inshallah. Um, so, Without further ado, I will introduce our next speaker. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Rania Awad. She is a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine, and also the director of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. She's also the associate chief of the Division of Public uh, Mental Health and Public uh, Population Sciences, and also the co-chief of the Diversity and Cultural Mental Health section. Um, in addition, she's also the director of the Rahman Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating Muslim women and girls. She's also studied, um, prior to studying medicine, she's also pursued clinical Islamic studies in Syria and holds certifications in Quran, Islamic law, and other branches of the Islamic sciences. So without further ado, it is an honor to introduce to you Dr. Rani Awad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's so wonderful to be here with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Huda. And thank you to the Canadian Muslim Mental Health Conference and of course, uh, the University of Toronto. We miss uh, being there in person with all of you, <laughs> mashallah. Um, hopefully in some time in the future that will be possible again. Uh, wonderful, um, I see here, Dr. Fung, it's wonderful to see you every year <laughs> in these conferences and also, um, hello, and also the uh, all the wonderful organizers of, of this conference. Uh, mashallah, you guys have uh, worked really hard to put this together. And this morning, inshallah, I look forward to what I hope to be a really, um, uh, inshallah, interactive conversation related to destigmatizing mental health from within the Islamic tradition. And so I hope, um, if first what I'll do is I'll kind of share my slides and we'll talk through a little bit here together. And then I understand that we have some time to, uh, you know, discuss with Q and A inshallah. So let me go ahead and share this. And I hope this is clear to everybody. So before we begin, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. I have no disclosure, disclosures to um, say and a little bit about my own affiliations as Dr. Huda was very kind to, to share earlier. Um, what I like to say earlier at the very beginning of these talks are a couple of resources and towards the end, I will also share some resources. Um, this is our lab's webpage the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. And there are a lot of, num there are a number of different lines of research within this lab. Much of what I'm going to be presenting today is actually developed inside of the lab. And um, if you're interested or it piques your interest, please use this page as a resource to know what we're up to, what kind of uh, lines of research and projects we're currently running, all on the topic of Muslim mental health. And perhaps at one point in the future, you might be interested to be involved. Oops, looks like we're going backwards instead of frontwards. Let's do this the right way, inshallah. <laughs> the other organization that I'd like to uh, share with you today, which will come up um, quite a bit actually, since we're talking about destigmatizing mental health from within the Islamic tradition, is a community nonprofit organization that's attached to our lab called Maristan. 
And uh, Mary Sten's tagline, as you see here, is revive our heritage, reclaim our legacy, and rewrite our narrative. If you've heard me speak before, you know that these are three lines that I say very often and will come up today in our conversation as well. I feel very strongly um, about the idea of making sure that we understand what healing methods are actually indigenous and within our tradition itself. Often when you work with Muslim communities, um, they find that if in fact the healing methods that you are referring to, particularly as psychiatrists or those who are mental health clinicians of other uh, disciplines, that if you're able to have the healing methods actually be from within the tradition um, and bridge it to modern day clinical practice, that is often the most useful for so many families, Muslims, and individuals who feel um, otherwise the, the types of treatments that they're receiving in the, in the current mental health field disconnected from them. And so we'll talk more and more about this in time. Uh, just quickly, people often ask me, what does Maristan mean? We actually have a few slides on this later from a historical lens, but it's really the English word, the shortened word of the original word, Bimadistan. And the Bimadistans were, in fact, the um, Islamic hospitals of the past. They were, uh, they were very rich in um, having mental health services within them. And they were the first in civilization to our knowledge that actually had mental health wards, actual sections dedicated to psychiatric care within hospital systems. So there's something about the Islamic tradition in its holistic sense that really brings in the discussion of mental health from the beginnings of the origins of Islam. And so that is part and parcel of why we're having this discussion today. And please do visit this website as well, maristan.org. I think you'll find some really interesting resources there as well. And with that, here is our overview for today's conversation. We're going to talk about a little bit about mental health from an Islamic viewpoint. We will talk about this term called Islamic psychology and how it differs from the term called Muslim mental health. We'll go a little bit into history, and then we'll talk about Islamic treatment tools and spirituality. And then we'll have some time for Q&A and discussions of any questions you all might have. So let's go ahead and first begin uh, talking about mental health from an Islamic concept. If we think about, um, you know, here we go. <laughs> all right, there we go. If we think about um, mental health, if you don't mind actually taking a few moments in the chat box and putting in some of your thoughts, would love to hear what comes to mind for you when you hear the term mental health in a cell. Let's start there. I'll give you just a moment to think that through, inshallah. I see some responses coming through and I appreciate that. We have things like spirituality and mind, body, soul connection, compassion, stigma. It's difficult to discuss, feeling at peace, a peaceful submission to God, nice. Seeking solace from the Quran, nice. Misconceptions, okay, very good. Okay. Sakina, healing, submission, excellent. Very good, thank you very much, mashallah. And so you see here that there are a number of themes that are connected to each other. There are a lot of similarities in the, the answers that came through, but there are also a good bit of divergence in what exactly, you know, when, when you hear of mental health in Islam, there's some divergence too in what it is that that elicits in your ears, mashallah. So let's go ahead and talk about this in a little more depth. First, here we'll talk a little bit about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how the Islamic viewpoint puts the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, as the ultimate guide and the role model for all people. And particularly when we think about well-being of any sort, the reference often goes back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the ultimate guide and role model. And so when we talk about mental well-being, this would be in the Islamic lens, the same, that you would go back to, well, what did the Prophet وسلم, say? What, how did, what did he say about mm, anything related to mental wellness? Well, one of the first things that we'll mention is that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace be upon him, when he would wake up every morning, would recite this particular dua or prayer. And he would say, 
O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from worry and grief. Now, just pay attention to these words closely, okay? Worry and grief from incapacity and laziness, from cowardice, cowardice and miserliness, and from being heavy in debt and being overpowered by other people. This is a daily prayer. And we are told that if a person finds themselves worried or is um, dealing with difficulties, that they should recite this too in line with what the prophet peace be upon him used to recite and i draw your attention specifically to the words worry and grief because sometimes we find people in our muslim community and this is a theme we're going to talk about all through today is they'll say no 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 mental health doesn't have at least modern conception mental health doesn't have room in islam you don't need that or point to me something in the, the tradition in the sunnah in the hadith um, and where the discussion around mental health really is and so we don't have to go very far beyond the daily words of the prophet, peace be upon him, in which he specifically spoke to emotions like worry and grief. And gave us an antidote and remedy to help through that. Now, mind you, these are worry and grief are not pathological or clinical diagnoses. And we'll come to that in a moment. But you see that the acknowledgement of emotions like worry and grief are right there at the tip of the Prophet's tongue, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he teaches us to do the same. Okay. Hopefully this is a good reminder for people we work with, because sometimes they don't seem to connect, you know, uh, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to their own mental health. He also taught us that we're not immune to psychological challenges. And his own life story, the Sira, we learn that there is, that he himself dealt with a number of very difficult emotions and very difficult moments in his life. And when people talk about, no, 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 uh, my family member shouldn't be this depressed, you know, like in clinical practice, they're, they should pick themselves up, they shouldn't be so, and I hear the word often lazy, or things like um, they should just have enough faith or iman to be able to get, off, get, get through with this, you know, uh, moping around what they're doing. You know, this is not our way. And I say, really? What is your way? <laughs> and sometimes I'll say, as a Muslim, is your way the way of the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? So yes, of course. So well, in the Prophet's life, peace be upon him, he experienced a good bit of grief and stress in his own life. And in fact, there was an entire year of his life that the, the scholars of the Sita it title the year of sadness, Am al Huzn. And the reason that they call it that is because there was one loss after another that were very important to him. His greatest protector was his wife, his uncle. There was the incident very famous that all Muslims are familiar with of Ta'if, how he was humiliated in the streets. And there was a, surrounded by an economic boycott of years worth of cutoff of any food and trade to the Muslims. It was a difficult moment in time in his lifespan. And so when you think about this very intense period, right, how he was in fact sad, and it was in fact difficult, we learn that stress and grief and sadness are all aspects of the normal natural human experience. And we're taught how to modulate that. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more. But sometimes again, we we, we don't tie the connection, like we know this story and we know about depression, right? But we don't tie things together. And I'm not saying that this is an incident of depression, rather what I'm saying is these human emotions, when unchecked and undealt with, will lead potentially to things like depression. Right? But sometimes it's important to tie things together for people, right? And other uh, examples from the Quran, other prophets of God, like Yaqub, the, the father of, or Jacob, the father of Yusuf, Joseph. And how, for example, his level of sadness and distress over the loss of his son and later sons causes him in the Quran specifically, the verse says that he goes blind and there's some discussion on whether it's an actual blindness or kind of a, a metaphorical blindness of, right, from sorrow, from grief, intense grief. 
And you talk to the average Muslim, they probably know this story, they probably have heard it before, but they don't necessarily tie it to distress and mental health. So we start the conversation right, directly from the Quran, directly from the Sunnah. Sometimes this is very helpful for people to be able to make these connections, right? Um, and then there are a number of really wonderful narrations from the Hadith literature that talk about mental health, that you can see themes of mental health kind of emerging. And it would be to your benefit if you are working with the Muslim population to know where these verses are and where these hadith or hadiths are, to be able to pick through them and, and uh, use them for the comfort of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the patients that you're working with or clients. <clears throat> for example, there is a wonderful narration from Salman of Badassi in which he's talking to Abu Darda and uh, these were, they were joined together as brothers by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He would be in the early, in the early Medinan society, he joined brothers together and sisters together. Okay. And these two individuals were joined together as, as brothers in faith. And um, one time Abu Dada uh, was, was very zealous, right? And he said, I'm going to, you know, pray all night and not sleep. And I'm going to fast all day and not break my fast. And I'm going to de dedicate everything, you know, to, to that's kind of like that extreme of spirituality that sometimes people get very kind of taken in one direction. And his dear brother and companion said to some man Fadis, he said to him, but your Lord has a right upon you. And your own self has a right upon you. And your family has a right upon you. So give each their right. This kind of balance that needs to happen in order to be healthy mentally and wellness wise. And the story reaches the prophet, peace be upon him, who hears this and he says, Salman has spoken the truth. And that's how it's narrated. And that's why we even have the story within our Hadith literature, because they take the story to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he says, he says, Salman is actually what's the same, right? And so reminding people that even when we talk all the, all the time in our therapy sessions and our healing sessions with, with, with our patients and clients, we're reminding them to keep balance in their life. But we may not necessarily draw upon the tradition itself that gives you that extra proof, right? Or that extra evidence that sometimes people go, oh yeah, I did learn about that, right? And they kind of connect things together, right? And, uh, and, and, and by the way, that concept, you know, the holistic understanding kind of like all aspects of your life need to be in balance and unison um, is very much an Islamic concept. The word holistic will come up quite a bit in our discussions today. Now, let's talk a little bit about this term called Islamic psychology. Because often we hear like this conference is the Muslim Mental Health Conference for Canada. <laughs> and it's so, and by the way, congratulations on your fourth year. This is really exciting. There's another term that often comes up called Islamic psychology, and people say, well, what's the difference between the two? And as you know, the word psychology, the psyche, right, from the Greek roots of breath, spirit, soul, and logia, the study of. And when we add the term Islamic in front of psychology, you basically um, have some discussion of like, well, what's, what makes psychology Islamic versus not Islamic, right? And what I want to share with you today is that there is, in fact, a difference between Muslim mental health, which is largely defined as uh, clinicians of all backgrounds who work with Muslim clients or patients and are invested in their mental health, right, of all various different Muslim populations. Whereas Islamic psychology is different. Islamic psychology is actually coming from within the frame of Islam itself. And pulling up like what we did in the earlier slides, pulling up indigenous Islamic practices into the psychological field. So it's a different approach. And in Arabic, the, the closest equivalent, since we don't have the term historically psychology in Arabic, but the closest equivalent of this would be ilm al nafs, right? Because we just said earlier, the Greek words were the study of the soul, the spirit, right? Well, in Arabic, ilm and nafs or the study of the nafs, right? Which some people translate as the self, some translate it as the soul, others will say ruh is the soul. Regardless, the study of oneself, one psyche, 
is something that the early Muslims actually spent a lot of time doing. And we have, and this will hopefully in this presentation, you'll learn a whole lot about this today. But you compare, for example, modern psychology to Islamic psychology, and you'll see, oops, let's go back for a moment there, kind of went a little fast. <laughs> you'll see that there are key differences. In today's modern psychology, there's certainly a very secular frame to it. There was a time that Western psychology had the soul infused in it. But many people will say that today, the soul has been taken out of psychology because it is difficult to empirically test it. And it has shifted away from philosophizing about the soul. And it has a very empirical and rational approach of really just mind body. When you compare that to Islamic psychology, you very much find that there's a mind, body, soul connection, right? And there are yes, empirical and yes, rational sources, but there's also a very important third piece here. And that is revelatory or scriptural sources. So there is a study of the physical, but also the metaphysical. And this of course would only be possible from within the tradition itself. So the approaches are different. And the reason I'm spending a good bit of time explaining the difference between the two is because we don't want to confuse them or confound them. And there are some of our patients and clients who are going to be perfectly happy with Muslim mental. And there are others who are specifically looking for Islamic psychology. And so with that, you know, I'm going to share with you, oh, here's the comparison of the two side by side. Um, but I'm going to share with you a little bit about kind of the terms from Islamic psychology. What are those posts, you know, the goalposts that you're looking for? So let's say here, if you look at the four constituents of the human being within Islamic psychology, you'll see that there is a core. This is the, the model, by the way, that uh, Imam al-Fazali writes, that the core is at the heart, the pipe. Now, in modern psychology, often the term is the mind. It goes straight to mind, mind sciences, neurosciences. It's housed within schools of medicine often. It is within, um, you know, psychiatric studies is, you know, even our boards are, you know, combined between psychiatry and neurology. It's very mind oriented. But in Islamic psychology, the origin is actually the heart, not the beating heart in your chest, but rather the metaphysical heart the qalb in Arabic, that's at the core. And from there, there is a connection to all of the other aspects. The mind, the cognitive, the intellect, being one of the connections. But so is the ruh, the spirit or soul, and so is the self, the nafs. Those two have been largely taken out of modern psychology, some people call it Western psychology, or a very kind of a Eurocentric frame of psychology. Why does that become important? When you ask, when we talked, the, the title today was about destigmatizing mental health. For so many Muslims, this is part and parcel of why there is stigma against the field. They don't find that their tradition, their spirit, that their spiritual tradition is highlighted within the current psychiatric and psychological field. They don't see themselves there. And because of that, they say, I don't know about this, or I don't want this. <laughs> and I think I've shared my story before on the stages of the Canadian Muslim Mental Health Conference of how I grew up right, with a lot of internalized stigma against mental health myself. It, it took me until the very last moment, right, when I entered into the field, and I was still saying, no, I don't know about this. Even, even as a psychiatrist, <laughs> I could ask my program director. It's a funny conversation we have sometimes today, where, you know, I, was, I don't know about this field. You know, but I'm going to look at the Islamic, you know, heritage and tradition to figure out what the connection is. And here is some of that connection. Right? Where if you look at and if you're finding patients and clients who have that same internalized stigma, part and parcel of the discussion is to go to, well, what do they find are missing? Often they'll tell you it's this right here, the spirit and the self, right? The ruh, right? The soul is missing from the discussion, their spirituality. And so when you look at um, even other traditions, like if we look at other, let's say Eastern traditions, not non-Islamic kind of Eastern traditions, you find 
but there's also connections between mind, body, soul. And they too will complain of the same thing, that Western psychology doesn't quite capture <laughs> what they need either. And there are many studies today that show an incredible significance between the importance of the mind-body connection, right? Whether that's an emotional kind of uh, impact on immune systems or whether it's, you know, the psychological factors of cardiac conditions. I mean, there's phenomenal uh, research at the time. But what we, uh, we agree with all of these, but where there really is a connection uh, missing is the soul. And if you look at Islam, you're going to see that it is so key <laughs> that if you don't include it in, you're really missing an important part of the discussion and rapport with your patients and clients, and either or they may, they may lose them altogether, right? And this is why we're, we're talking about what do you need to do from within the faith itself. And so what we're trained on today is often the biological, uh, the biopsychosocial model. And it's an excellent model. It takes into effect, of course, genetics and biology, it takes into effect, you know, like we talked about the psychological, which is often on the neuroscience side of things, which takes into effect the social aspects, which are so key. But, you know, again, what's missing, it's that spiritual piece. It's that, you know, biopsychosocial spiritual model. That's really that extra piece there that's really missing. And so when you think about it from that perspective, I'm going to invite you to look at this case scenario. We can read it together. And I'm going to invite you to think about what I said about that biopsychosocial spiritual model and how, especially for those who are clinicians here, how that might change the way you would have looked at a case like this. So here's Amina. She's a friend from school. She confides in you and tells you that she's feeling hopeless. She has fatigue, loss of appetite, loss of interest in her studies, and she's felt like this for the last three months. So if we pause here, I know all of you who are <laughs> clinicians in the room already have a working diagnosis, right? Now, she goes on to tell you she believes that these feelings are caused by the evil eye, Nazar, or Ayin. And she's worried that someone has done black magic on her, Seher. And she's unwilling to consider any other factors, even though you keep trying to tell her, I think what's going on here is, let's say, depression. Right? But she's not willing to listen to you about anything. She's so convinced that this is where it's coming from. So if you could just take a moment in your chat box, uh, in the chat box here, and write about what would you do next? What are your next steps? Let's give you a moment, inshallah, to do that. How would you advise Amin? How would you draw on that? holistic, biopsychosocial, spiritual model. We won't do a breakout group like it says here, but just take a few moments and put this into your chat box. What would you do? All right, so we have some, we have some responses coming in. Coping strategies, protective factors, nice. Okay, so you would expand the conversation, nice. Okay. If she's using things like praying and fasting. All right. Connections with an imam. All right. Understand what she under, what she understands about the evil eye, what, what she thinks caused it. All right. So try to get to the roots. Nice. Nice. Validate her feelings first and then ask her about other options. Okay. Motivational interviewing or am I to really understand, to really better understand her, where she's coming from. Ask her what she's tried so far. Yes. A lot of really great ideas, a lot of really great um, reflections on what could you possibly do to help you. So, oops, hang on, <laughs> before we go there. Um, and so, you know, to just reflect back for all the things that you all mentioned, uh, much of what you have here, there are some things that I, uh, you know, wouldn't necessarily directly agree with in this very moment, but there are many things that you've said that I would absolutely agree with. Um, expanding the conversation, understanding the root causes, uh, validating and saying something to the effect of not, well, not, not a blanket validation of you are right, but rather 
it's the kind of thing of making sure that she's heard, under, that, you, that she understands that you have heard her, right? And trying to see if she's, you know, willing to kind of expand that, her own reference and frame of things. Sometimes it's a matter of saying things to the effect of, and that may be, could there be other explanations, right? And sometimes when you validate and just simply say not, yes, you're right, or yes, you're wrong, but rather just sort of suspend judgment and say something to the effect of like, that may be, can we talk about other aspects, right? And allows you and allows the person to feel heard enough to say, okay, what else is there, <laughs> you know? Okay, doc, you know, it allows you to bring in some of these other things like biology, like genetics, like understanding, you know, that this constellation of symptoms actually has a name and a potential diagnosis, right? And if she were to ask, like some of you have written here, well, what else could I do beyond what you have in your toolbox? No. It really comes down to how willing are you to expand your own reference frame of what it is she could be doing to help herself. And this is where it's a very interesting line. I find that most psychiatrists, um, including ones who are Muslim, are not super comfortable with the idea of saying to her, and there was a constant, there was a couple of you earlier that said, make sure she's also in contact with an imam or contact with a spiritual leader. And most, most physicians I speak to are not very comfortable collaborating with spiritual leaders, but this may be a perfect moment to do so. And especially not just any spiritual leader, I wanna be very clear, it really does have to be someone who's more psychologically minded, who there is a back and forth connection here, where you say, well, let's talk to so-and-so and collaborate with the spiritual leader. And that spiritual leader is willing to collaborate with you as a psychiatrist and kind of say, this is what I can give you from the spiritual remedies, but this is also where my line is drawn in terms of my expertise. And you need to go to, you know, Dr. Rania to continue the conversation. Right, that kind of back and forth. And that's, you know, I know that you've had a session uh, last night with the imams and, um, and I think it's a beautiful thing to have these collaborative spaces because for some clients and patients, you're not gonna win them over with all of the neuroscience that you know. Or by kind of, you know, or you get the thing where the patient in the room just go kind of nods and goes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and walks out of your room and is absolutely the opposite of what you should have done because there's no rapport actual built, there's no validation, there's no feeling heard. And also there are in fact aspects from within the tradition itself that can be very, very useful for them to heal. So let's talk about some of those. So here we look a little bit before I share the, you know, there's two sections here, one on historical reference, and we have some context, and then we'll talk about actual tools. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's definitely um, a number of people in our societies that say, in our communities, that say mental illness can only be cured spiritually. I'm curious how many of you have heard this? How many of you have actually heard this before? But we have a number, I'm seeing different hands being raised, people saying yes in the chat box. It's very, I would say very, very common, very common. And so it is, in fact, and some psychiatrists will say, this is not my, or mental health clinicians of different sorts will say, this is not my uh, battle, but it is your battle. It's your battle because often <laughs> you are the person who can actually help expand a person's thinking related to this. And it, this kind of attitude, it does reinforce the stigma around mental illness, but burying it or just hiding from it also also reinforces the stigma too, right? I have found in my own personal work, and you know how much I really enjoy and I'm very passionate about Islamic history and our kind of past. In fact, you know, my organization is, the namesake is literally in reference to that beautiful heritage, right? Ameristan. Um, but I wanna tell you that sometimes I find that the breakthrough with some of our patients and clients is actually in knowing that heritage they feel somehow they, they have permission to continue engaging in the mental wellness plan that you have for them, because this is not something that's foreign to them or the, their own tradition. 
that it's not some transplant from another civilization or heritage or something into them, or they're not doing something that is egregious to their own spiritualistic understanding of the world that's informed by their own faith, right? And so as we think about how do you do this, right? What do you do? For me, one of the first things I do when somebody starts to kind of buck a little bit and, and dig in their heels and say, oh, I don't know about this stuff, right? I'll share a little background. And, I'll, and today we don't have time to go through all these different um, historical contributions from all these major scholars of different disciplines. This is a very, the, not, you know, the, the science that we today translate roughly as Islamic psychology was incredibly interdisciplinary. We're talking about philosophy, medicine, spirituality, and ethics, right? All kinds of different scholars contributed to it. Today, I'm gonna to focus in on some very, very specific people because they had interventions that are very useful for you, tools, I think, inshallah. And it, it's very helpful for me to be able to say, to quote names that people already know from within our communities and our society. Right? So let's take, for example, someone like Arazi, who um, is just phenomenal in that he is, we talk about the hospitals, I mentioned earlier, and I'm gonna have a couple slides on the hospitals in a minute. He was somebody who was not just a practicing physician, but he was somebody who was in charge of creating hospitals and many, um, and in his own hospital, actually a, a number of hospitals, but he had a main hospital that he was in charge of and actually later become, became an administrator of the hospital. He was very particular in having mental health treatments within his hospital system and a whole war dedicated to it. And the first instance of psychiatric aftercare that we know of in humanity actually was the device, the blueprint for by Arazi. So there's a lot here. There's a lot with Arazi and mental health and it's very fascinating that today's conversation isn't only on Arazi. So I'll just share a few things that sometimes I share with patients that I find very useful. <clears throat> the concept of the humane treatment of the mentally ill. Often people say, Islam, if you, even if you look up Islamic medicine on Wikipedia, you'll get humane medicine. It's beautiful. Like I'm so um, inspired and honored by that tradition. And humane treatment, not just of all health and illness, but also specifically in mental illness. That's part of our tradition. So some people really worry about if I engage the psychiatric system, will I, how will I be treated? Especially things like if I take your medications, will I turn into a zombie? Will I, will I not be who I am anymore? Things like that, right? And so I talk to them about the concept of the holistic mental health treatment and that very humane concept. Arazi wrote quite a bit and encouraged the concept of self-analysis, awareness, feedback, reasoning, right? And he was a champion of what we call the client-patient relationship. He had whole books of ethics written on the doctor-patient relationship and what would be ethical and what would be unethical, right? Writing in early, early <laughs> Islam here, mashallah, early Islamic history. And he talks in great detail. He had this book of cases, many of which are actually psychiatric cases, where he talks about his observations and how to treat the mentally ill and how to do so in the most humane, ethical way. And one tidbit that I'll share with you, there's this fascinating things here. But when I say about psychiatric aftercare, one of the beautiful things Arazi instituted and then many of the Maristans after him instituted as well, which was that um, if a psychiatric patient came into his hospital, and after treating them, he would discharge them with three gold dinars. They would be given, they would be treated so humanely within that system, but then they would also be given uh, money once they left. Why? Because the understanding is in order to reintegrate back into society with nobility and honor, right? They would should be able to do so even if they've been away at the mental health ward for a long period of time. Two of the dinadas are for them to be able to have clothing, food, and shelter, right, in an honorable way. And the third of the dinadas was to, for them to start a business, seed money to start a business. I mean, it's so forward thinking, so progressive, right? And sometimes when people sit back and listen to this and go, wait, that's our tradition? I say, that's our tradition, right? It just allows, it kind of, it kind of like softens something in the conversation. You have the example of Abu Zayd al balkhi and if you've heard me speak before about Abu Zayd al balkhi you know how passionate I am because several of my papers 
um, are on al Balkhi, and he's a ninth century scholar. And his, his book literally is called The Sustenance of the Body and Soul. Masalih al Abdan wal Antas. And he brings these two worlds together. And half of the book, the mental health part of the book, has been translated by the late uh, Dr. Malik Badri, one of my mentors. And, um, and uh, in some of the works that I've published, I've showed how uh, Al Balkhi has the full classification diagnosis of modern, what today the modern day we would call OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder in the ninth century. Classification, the diagnosis, and even the gold standard treatment, even to expose, even to detailing how exposure therapy works in the ninth century. That's why the paper became such a milestone paper because it rewrites the narrative. It kind of rewrites history of psychology, right? And he did the same, we have another paper on phobias. And there's so many things Benchi talks about, but it's really beautiful to see at that point. And sometimes, and I have, I have a number of patients with OCD, I have a very OCD heavy um, client load, patient load. And um, I talk about Benchi all the time with them because there's always a, no, 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 this is a weakness on me. This is a failure on me. This is something that I should be able to do better. And you all know that part of OCD is a compulsive act that you actually, it's very difficult to control. We teach, of course, it's what we do, exposure therapy, we teach cognitive strategies and these medications. And people are like, no, 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 I don't want to do this, right? And then I'll start talking about their own heritage, their own history. I talk about Balkhi and people are always kind of like, kind of, there's a little bit of a shock value there. But then I'll say, and you know what Balkhi said of how to treat OCD in the ninth century? He had three steps. Number one, medications. Number one, what? Medications? Yes, he mentioned medications. Number two was the exposure therapy, the very same modern day we have our ERP, right? Exposure and ritual prevention therapy. Okay. That's detailed in his book. And number three, spiritual advice. Now, the field today acknowledges the first two. But again, modern psychology has lost its soul. So number three isn't fair. But as a Muslim practitioner who's working with a Muslim client with OCD or patient with OCD, I bring on all three. And because of that holistic kind of way, usually patients, and we all know this, once you get to the level of moderate, severe, extreme OCD, you need the medications to really be able to do better, to, to, to really resolve the issues. It's a chronic condition. It's not going to be cured. Rather, it can be treated. And part of that treatment is for them to even listen to the medications piece, right? I engage in sometimes number two and three and eventually get to number one. These are strategies, again, from within that tradition. It's very important. And yes, I'm speaking about very historical things, but people really do, just like we take from Hadith and Quran, there's something very special about talking about your own heritage, your own people, your own advances of Islam, right? In the sciences, it's usually a very helpful technique, not for everybody, but for some, this is helpful. Here's a third example. Abu Muhammad al-Ghazali. Now, al-Ghazali is such a well, al-Bakhi is not necessarily a known name. In fact, before, before the, my, own, my own papers and the translations of Dr. Badri, which coincided at the same time, and, uh, and Dr. Badri himself being one of the first to discover in modern times this um, uh, manuscript that was basically buried in the dust of time for so long, al-Bakhi is named only in the last five to 10 years has really become more known. Um, in fact, that manuscript was found in the 90s. So if you can imagine, it was buried in the dust of time for hundreds of years. So his name isn't as well known as someone like Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali, you go to most Muslims, they heard Al-Ghazali, right? And Al-Ghazali is not a physician. Al-Ghazali, of course, is a, we, he, we put him in the category of the theologians, right? The category of the spiritual teachers. But he contributed so much, again, in that interdisciplinary frame of Islamic psychology, it contributed so much. He wrote, you know, 70 books, right? Some of which you all know, like the Ihya, Ihya al But he also wrote books on like the Alchemy of Happiness, right? And other such books. And I'll share with you very specific tools that um, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali brought up that actually I use today in therapy with my own patients. Um, very consistently. <laughs> and uh, it's very beautiful to see how it is that we can actually pull from this. And because his name has that kind of validation already, 
it's actually not so hard to be able to say, look, let's do the six steps, six steps, what I call the six M's, right? Or the six memes, if you're <laughs> familiar with Arabic, the letter meme, like the M's, where he talks about, you know, let's do goal setting. Now, anybody who does therapy here, you know that this is one of the first steps of therapy. But there's so much of what we do that echoes within the tradition. So look at Imam Ghazali's steps, right? He says, number one, set a goal. If you want to grow and you want to change, set the goal. Number two, he talks about you need to be able to monitor if your goal is going well or not. So much of what we do in therapy with these, you know, uh, workbooks and uh, keeping our journals and so on is doing what? Is doing a muraqaba on whether or not we're able to meet whatever your cognitive or behavioral strategy you're working with, you, with your patient or client, right? There is a goal setting and there is a monitoring. We need to monitor ourselves. And so the homework that people do between sessions is a form of muraqaba, right? And I'll bring in the spiritual piece in just a moment, but just listen to this because it's very similar to probably some things we're already doing with human age in therapy. Number three is let's evaluate. Let's come back to the next session, look at the, make sure we're looking at our goals and what is the monitoring that you did throughout the week and let's evaluate, them, which is muhasaba. So we're, we're basically evaluating how we've been able to reach that goal or not. Number four, right, is muhasaba. And muhasaba is our consequences, right? We're able to say, okay, if we didn't meet the goal, if, if let's say the cognitive strategy, the behavioral strategy that you're using that particular week was um, you know, related to, um, I do quite a bit of work. And like I said, with OCD and it's exposure therapy, we have like homework that a, that a patient has to do every single day until the next session, right? And, and, and we'll say, okay, were you able to do that particular exercise? Well, I really couldn't do it this day. It was too overwhelming. Or my suds, which are my you know, units of distress and therapy are too high. Right. Okay. Let's go back and let's go back to the <laughs> drawing board and figure out how to break these into smaller pieces. But then sometimes you do have to hold yourself to account. Right. There has to be consequences. Okay. So what happens if you don't do that step? Some people would say, okay, let's increase the time or let's make it smaller steps or some sort of consequence. So Imam Al Ghazali uses the word, you know, muakaba, the consequences. And then he has in the sixth point, the, uh, oops. There we go. I went, well, anyway, they, they both came up here. <laughs> the next one, number five, is the mu'atiba or the reprimand. There's a certain amount of reprimand where we say, all right, here are the consequences. What will I do to try to get better at this? How do I hold myself fully accountable? Because it's hard work. And we always talk about therapy being what? Work, the work of therapy. It's hard work. And that's where number six comes in, mujahada or exertion. These six steps Imam Ghazali outlined as the steps of change and growth. And for anybody, again, who's either in therapy or you are the therapist, you'll see echoes of what you're doing within this, but you probably don't quote Imam Ghazali, right? But I do in my work and most people who are in Islamic psychology spaces do as well. And we find that there's actually a lot more buying and a lot more rapport built, especially from people who are looking for that spiritual um, acknowledgement or integration into the very therapy that they're doing. Otherwise, they're taking this work to home and going, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or maybe they're motivated because they really want to get better, but they're feeling like that third piece, right, right, of that, that biopsychosocial spiritual model that's missing in the story. And of course, Imam Ghazali is a teacher of spirituality. So there's a lot here on the layers of the diseases of the heart the kind of things you don't find in the DSM, anger, rancor, greed, envy, malice, right? That he talks about that we put as part of our goal setting and monitoring and evaluation and so on, because you're bringing in the psychological aspect, the spiritual aspects into that psychological space as well. From the Muslim tradition, it's all holistic. It's all very connected to each other. We don't disconnect them. And many times the stigma again is coming from that disconnect. And so with that, you know, comes the last part of our conversation here today before we open up for some uh, questions and answers and engagement with you. I'm really thinking about, you know, 
these Islamic treatments, right? <clears throat> I shared with you how the Islamic religious influence um, really created different paths. You, we talked about the prophetic sunnah or the hadiths, right, that we talked about earlier. And there is a term that you may have also heard, which is called qub. Um, but, but that particularly refers to Islamic medicine, prophetic medicine, right? And there are aspects from within Qub that actually can be very useful even in modern psychiatric and psychological practices. And I'll share with you some of that. Another thing to take into account is that in traditional healing systems, whether you look at Greek medicine, Chinese medicine, Persian medicine, right? There are other aspects beyond our osteopathic and allopathic medical systems. And many Muslims would claim that when they go to the MD or the DO or so on, it is very kind of confining. And they'll say things like, aren't there other ways of healing, right? Aren't there other ways of doing this, right? And this is where if you're not trained in it, you also suspend judgment and you sort of say, there could be. Whereas many, many MDs that I speak to, and I myself, I say this as myself an MD, right? We'll say, no, 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 no. we have what's right. <laughs> Where are the ones who are FDA approved and where are the ones with our medications are, and where are the ones that have the evidence-based trials, right? And they kind of cut off any other possibility of healing that people sometimes do find benefit in, right? And that's a real turnoff for so many people. So I'm just telling our young clinicians here to be careful of that. And also, yes, you don't want to necessarily uh, you know, ascribe to something that doesn't have a lot of evidence backing it. But it's important to know that the people, your patients, are coming from traditions are coming from backgrounds that they are actually looking for healing wherever it may necessarily be. And it may not necessarily be your training these traditions, right? So just an acknowledgement of traditional healing methods may be important here too. Rapport building is so, so key. And so back to the earlier slide that I just shared, I would say when someone, especially here, we're in California, California has a, you know, a lot of alternative forms of medicine <laughs> that are widely used here. And even if I'm not fully familiar with it, you know, and somebody wants to go, let's say, to a Chinese medicine doctor, I'll say, you know, my first question to them, has it been helpful? Not a judgment of, why'd you do that? <laughs> and I'm not ascribing one way or another because it's not my field or my practice, right? It's not my expertise. But if my patient has found some benefit in it, right, it's also important to kind of acknowledge that there may be other forms of healing that could be beneficial. And so speaking of that holistic care and that holistic model um, that we shared about earlier, there are, and very much Islamically um, sanctioned and acknowledged, are different firm, forms of healing, whether that be dietary, whether that be spiritual, whether that be um, you know, cognitive and behavioral. And so it's important to know that our Islamic worldview is very holistic all-encompassing in that way. But sometimes as modern day trained psychiatrists and psychologists and other forms of mental health clinicians, remember that you're only trained in one of those domains. It's really key. It's part of our humility, even within our expertise, right? To say, there may be other things out there too. I can't emphasize that enough. It's such, a, it's such an important point of humility. Right, that I don't find most people within my own colleagues necessarily have that level of humility. It's a real turn off to the patients. Now, when we look in terms of um, historically, what did Muslims use or what did they say? Look, wherever Islam went, whatever civilization and country it entered into, and it certainly entered into Persia, you know, the Persian uh, societies and into the Chinese, you know, all the way to China and so on. Every civilization, Indian medicine, every civilization that it entered into, it took what worked. It took within it, it folded within it those indigenous practices as long as they were aligned with the faith. Right? As long as it didn't have you know, divination or some weird astrology or some other thing that you know, the faith does not allow for. But everything else was welcomed. And that includes whether these are medicinal plants and remedies, the Prophet himself said, Allah has used many of these in his own lifetime, whether these were syrups and ointments, you know, forms of you know, herbs and so on that were used. The Muslims used these as well. There was no contradiction to this. In fact, the hadith here is al-hikmatu right? Wisdom 
is the property, right, of the believer. You take it wherever you find it and from wherever you learn it from, right? as long as it doesn't contradict kind of the core foundations of the religion. So you find here, you know, references to foods and honey and other forms of, um, uh, you know, practices like fasting, which are encouraged to actually help the body, the answer, and the mind. And this idea of mind-body therapy, of making sure that we kind of, um, uh, the connection between all three, mind, body, soul, would mean that there are um, contemplative, there we go, contemplative practices, that there are physical rest and practices, and there are dietary practices, there are spiritual practices that the Muslim is engaged in, and your Muslim patient or client is probably looking for. If you yourself can't offer all of these, then engage with others who can, like the example of the spiritual leaders who may be able to offer the spiritual aspect if that's not your training, right? And uh, like, likewise, you know, there may be physical nutri nutrition-based practices and you're not a nutritionist, but you engage in that, engage that as well, right? And allow your patient to look at that broader picture, right? So far in modern medicine, we're getting people to acknowledge the impact of nutrition and involving nutritionists on our team, right? The impact of, you know, um, uh, proper pharmacolog pharmacological practices and including members of uh, the, you know, the pharmacological team within our teams, right? Yeah, and so on and so forth. We haven't fully gotten all the way, minus chaplains, hospital chaplains in that one setting, we haven't fully integrated spirituality into our practices just yet. So reminders that these kinds of practices have always been part of um, the holistic Islamic prescriptions, whether that be massage, you know, forms of cupping, hydrotherapy, and I'll explain some of these in a moment. And where you see this all come to a head, all kind of come in unison and together, Again, I mentioned, I would say a little bit about the Bimadistans or the Madistans, the English word shortened, um, Maristans. These healing centers, this is what they were known for. They were built throughout the Muslim world and they, and everywhere Islam went, you found Maristans, every country <laughs> that Islam has been through, they have left the heritage of the Maristans there. I mentioned how they had the first mental health wards, but they also had these very beautiful, um, whether they were, gardens, very lavish greenery or fountains, all of which to help incorporate your five senses to be able to heal fully. This is what we mean by holistic healing, right? And if you just stick to just the neurosciences, you're going to lose this community as well because they want all of their senses incorporated. And you're talking about the just one, right? And if, again, if you can't offer this, then partner with those who can, right? And so anyhow, the Maristans had these specialized wings for and wards for mental illnesses, and they incorporated things like art therapy, sound therapy, some people call this music therapy, talk therapy, yes, talk therapy, and many other uh, you know, aspects. We have an entire book coming out on this very soon, inshallah, in the coming years, that we're working on um, pulling all of these historical references and resources into it. Um, and also papers that are coming out on, you know, things like music therapy and how there was a, an amazing use of sound and uh, very specialized to specific mental illnesses that we don't find before, you know, the Islamic era and civilization. It's fascinating. And so when you think about and talk therapies, you know, we've already talked about Balfi and his use of exposure therapies, uh, you know, form of a CBT and other forms of talk therapy. Why? because it was a very holistic understanding. And so what do they do this for? To reduce stress, to relax the patient, to make sure that there was a lower blood pressure. And they literally talk about the correlation between lower blood pressure and they talk about, and music, right? The kind of um, uh, the tones that they would use. If this person was very manic, for example, they would, bring, they would play these very soothing tones to kind of bring them down. And if they were very depressed, they would play tones that would bring them up. And it's, it's just a fascinating um, historical relevance and that goes all the way through the Ottoman Empire. So until very you know, recent modern history, right? I say all of this to remind us of our own tradition and talk therapies. We have proof of what today we might call the CBTs and the DVTs and kind of dynamic therapy and 
and, and so on that were used in this period of time. I emphasize this because sometimes you have to tell your patients and clients, this is not something that is foreign to you and foreign to your tradition. People say things like my mom told me not to, uh, you know, people in therapy say, my mom said I shouldn't be here because I shouldn't air my dirty laundry to a stranger. <laughs> so we talk about confidentiality and all the rest of it. But one of the things I often say is, you know, are you familiar with your own Islamic tradition around talk therapy? And most people say no. <laughs> I didn't even know that this was a concept or a thing that we had in our heritage. It's really important if you're in this field, particularly if you're trying to be within the Islamic psychology space, that even the Muslim mental health space, that you're familiar with this, at least familiarize yourself with some of this. And so as we kind of um, kind of wrap up and, and close a little bit here, you know, uh, reminders in cognitive therapy, some of the reminders that we give people are, that I try at least to bring in, are things directly again from the Quran and the Sunnah. Concepts of you know, affliction or suffering. In the last two years of the pandemic, I feel like it's been nonstop conversation about you know, why is this terrible thing afflicting us at this moment? And we talk about suffering and patience and gratitude and how in the faith tradition, Islamic faith tradition, so much of this is an expiation of sins as well. And that's usually very helpful for people to hear. We've talked about, I've talked with many of my patients about um, when they kind of buck at the idea of taking medication for a psychiatric condition. And I'll say, look, we have proof that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself and his wife, Sitana Aisha, they would prescribe, they would give physical treatments, medications and physical remedies and uh, foods and certain items physically to treat mental health conditions. We have proof that Sitana Aisha used something like talbina, which is this special dish of, you know, kind of concoction of barley, milk, and honey to treat people, to give to people who were anxious, who were depressed, who had psychosis, right? This may not be in line with modern practice, but the proof here is only this point that I'm trying to make, which is that they didn't just say, go pray more, go do more dhikr, have stronger iman. They actually gave physical remedies to psychological conditions. They understood that there was a connection between the two, right? And, and sometimes my patients are able to say, oh, oh I did, so that's okay? It's okay for me to do this? <laughs> and sometimes that's very helpful to just be able to know what to quote and how to quote it exactly, right? From within the tradition, right? And there's many, many other aspects here. And many of you know this, but may not have directly tied it to, you know, like but we, we have these beautiful concepts of like, what happens when a person is angry, right? And we're told, you know, if he's standing, he should sit, right? You should go make wudu, or she should go make wudu, right? This concept of do a physical action to an emotional feeling, right, that you're experiencing. Right? These are, are beautiful things to kind of incorporate, or the concept of hydrotherapy, right, where you have a use of water, or in some cases, do, um, infusing that with oils or herbal extracts, right? And, and you see today, people have that, you know, people like to use um, infusions and all these other things in the air, right? And it's like, yeah, we've always, we've always had this in our tradition because this concept of like, what's going to soothe you? Certain aroma therapies, right? Certain aromas kind of soothe people. Water helps kind of soothe people. And this is a whole kind of therapy in itself. So if this is kind of new to you, that's okay. But just understand and know that there are other ways of dealing with things beyond that, you know, the, the two or three main things that happen within the psychiatric and psychological fields. And they are part of the tradition. And lastly, as we think about mindfulness and meditation and meditative practices, and I have to tell you that in the Islamic psychology space, um, uh, many people are actually moving away from the word mindfulness into something more like heartfulness. Because I said earlier how Imam Ghazali, the core of his model was the heart, the qalb, right? And, and how um, mindfulness, as we know, is largely something that has become secularized in the field, but originally had Buddhist roots. And in that tradition and philosophy, the mind or mindfulness and reaching eventually nirvana is, um, works for that tradition. 
And of course, it's been evidence proved now over and over that mindfulness is very useful. In the more holistic Islamic tradition, however, if you focus on just mindfulness on one level, you may block some of the other levels. We have an entire paper coming out on this, inshallah, in the coming year. Look out for it on how we need to be careful not to fully um, well, misappropriate you know, uh, concepts that come from other religious and faith traditions that may not be fully in aligned with our more holistic understanding of this. We actually have indigenous practices like tafakkur and you know, like contemplation, mindfulness. We have the concepts of khalwan, atikaf. I'll share with you some of these terms right here. And I quote here Ibn Qayyim that there's actually multiple scholars that talk about different forms of meditative, contemplative practices from within the Islamic tradition that are not um, just about the mind. They are actually very holistic in mind, body, and soul. And, uh, and this is probably a lecture, this slide here, right here is probably a lecture in itself for its own time for another day, mashallah. But just to share with you some of the indigenous Islamic practices that are very much in line, in line with some of the work we do today. But again, you may not have the full picture. And your patient client may certainly not have the full picture unless you're actually infusing it and integrating. I like to use the word integrating, Islamically integrated psychotherapy. Um, by not knowing these other practices, what they are and where they come from, unless you've taken the time to study Islamic spiritual. So with that, you know, uh, I don't, and I actually have another slide on Ghazali. We talked a lot about Ghazali, but he also has, uh, like Imam al uh, um, a specific kind of aspects of how a person can really tune into these mindfulness and heartfulness kind of practices. So with that, here is how we close on the conversation on spirituality and mental health kind of just a wrap up and concluding slides of what we've talked about so far. We've talked about how, you know, it's really important that we integrate um, all the different aspects, biological, spiritual, uh, social, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, social into the conversation and being very, very careful, not um, neglecting any one of these because the Islamic world really takes in all of them into account. And if you are missing some of them, it feels foreign. It feels like it's not part of our actual tradition. Okay. And a balanced approach would actually be to try bringing in all different aspects within yourself, if you're able to, if you're a clinician listening to this, and if not to partner with those who have other aspects that you might be missing, right? The very integrative aspect. So, Back to the case that I shared with you at the very beginning, and I ask you now in closing, and we'll take questions in just a moment, to, 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 take, to look at the case again. Now maybe with a different set of eyes. And use the chat box, please, to now tell me, how would you work with Ami? What would you say or do differently than maybe you were, um, the maybe that you had said earlier? And maybe it was exactly what you said. Some of you may have had it, you know, hit the nail on the head. But right in the chat box, what did you learn in this session that you would look at a case like this maybe slightly different than how you looked at it before? Let's give you a moment to do that as we close here. Okay, very nice. Liaison more with spiritual leaders. Nice, okay, very good. Use the word heart more. Nice, not just mind. Mm -hmm. Couple more, couple more thoughts on this. Let's take a couple more of your thoughts. More holistic approaches. Thank you. Connecting with imams. Excellent. Very nice. Yeah. Nice. Bringing prophetic history. The year of sadness. Nice. Okay more holistic kind of understanding, um, more uh, nice, very <laughs> indigenous Islamic practices. Beautiful, beautiful, mashallah. I think that's exactly where, um, oops, let me just go back here. That's exactly where I'd like to kind of end here and just um, leave you with this idea of, of you know, really having um, a holistic understanding overall. And I'm so glad that the field is growing and increasing and every day that passes, there's actually more and more 
um, books and writings and articles available on how to actually do this. I think we're at a burgeoning of a field. We're kind of like, there's an incredible kind of burgeoning of the field at the moment. And for many of you who are in practice uh, or in training, this is a very exciting time. I think you're going to find a, you know, a, um, kind of a, a cohesion of sorts that's going to happen in a way that didn't happen. That certainly wasn't the way 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Uh, for those of us who've been in the field this long, um, it's it's really a beautiful thing. So I'm really excited to, to see this happening. And at this point in time, I'll stop here and take some of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rawad, for such a, an important conversation. Um, Certainly you brought up some really wonderful points during your talk about also the contribution of Islam in um, psychology and psychiatry. And I think uh, oftentimes Islam is not really recognized in that way. Um, I'm sure our audience found uh, your talk very beneficial for both clinicians and non-clinicians. Um, and also thank you so much for your work in, in helping destigmatize uh, mental illness in the Muslim population. It's really wonderful. So um, we will go on to the Q&A. Um, uh, you know, I think kind of given your, your case example, um, we have a question here about um, how to navigate around patients who strongly believe in the unseen and um, in gin impacting, uh, imp impacting them. I actually have a personal case of mine with a patient, a uh, young patient with psychosis and her parents were quite worried about her and, and asked me whether I believed that um, she was possessed by a chin to explain her psychosis. So um, I'm interested in your, your input into this question, Dr. Rowan. Sure, sure. It's a, it's a, I would say it's a very common question and those who are in the field, um, I, I urge you to get um, yeah, you know, ready and comfortable in answering this question. It will be part of your practice forever <laughs> on ongoing. And the first place that I start the conversation is really kind of understanding their understanding of jinn, their understanding of the supernatural, and what, what does that mean to them? Um, and I like to start there because my own understanding may differ actually from them, or it may be aligned. And this is where it's really important to hear out where they're coming from first. And if it is misaligned to your own viewpoint on this, this is where learning how to negotiate a conversation becomes really important. Somebody earlier put MI or kind of motivational interviewing um, skills and other forms of kind of negotiating um, uh, skills would be very, very important to me. I find myself very often saying to people, um, you know, who will say, we as, don't we as Muslims believe in the jinn? And I say, yes, as Muslims, we do believe in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created supernatural beings. We believe in the angels. We believe in the jinn. And uh, where we might diverge though <laughs> here is on what is the jinn capable of doing versus what is it not capable of doing. And this is a theological conversation. And you as a psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, social leader, so you may not be ready to engage or have the, the knowledge to, with which to exactly have a theological conversation. So this is the first step you have to say, what do I know versus what do I not know because I don't want to be the person misinforming me. In this case, though, I do encourage you to have a well-rounded knowledge and understanding of the theological uh, uh, um, concepts, not to have a theological debate, but just so you have some ground, right? And uh, often I'll have people that say, um, what if this psychosis they're seeing like, a, you know, unfortunately their child is going through or, or their family member themselves may be going through a psychotic episode or have been through one. And they'll say that was like, definitely gen possession. And so I'll start by expanding the conversation a little bit and say, can it be anything else? And if a person is willing to engage with me and the can it be something else, then we can start having the right, biological neuroscience kind of conversation. But if they're very close off to it, well, I start with them and saying, well, what is, what is it that you're looking for? And they'll say, I want out of here. Right, I want somebody to write, read, put it on over my kid, and or I want a, essentially what is an exorcism, right, to get this gin out of my chest. And I'll say, I'm not a gin doctor. Can't help you with that. Please. However, there are people in the community who claim that they are able to do this thing. You know, the reason I say that, <laughs> people may disagree with me here, is that because 
patients, once they leave your presence, are going to do whatever they want to do. You can't control what they do. But if they find that I'm willing to actually come to where they are at, meet them where they are, right? Then I have more of a chance of actually helping um, if my diagnosis was this is actually a psychotic condition and what they actually need are psychotropic medications, I'm not going to be able to even have or bridge that conversation unless they feel that I'm listening to them too. So in my back pocket in our local community, I have the number on I'm literally on speed dial of, you know, an imam, I haven't found more than an imam, who, who, is, um, who, who is actually what I call psychologically minded, somebody who actually says, and this is not any of these you know, um, clairvoyant kind of strange folks who, who, who charge a, a exorbitant amounts of money to do this kind of work, but rather someone who has ijaz, literally like Islamic license from, it's like a by lineage, right? From his father, from his grandfather, from, you know, on to do the rupiah, to be able to read the Quran. And I don't have an issue with somebody reading the Quran for themselves and their family member, but this particular imam will say, and this is my limit. Now go back to Dr. Rana, right? And get the medications you need. Right, because this is a psych, I've done what I can on the spiritual realm. This is a psychiatric condition. And that is so helpful when the imam is able and willing to say that. Because then there is kind of a buy-in. And I also didn't exclude or preclude that particular family from being able to get the help they want from a Quranic recitation. So my stance on these things are usually like, and it may be, I don't know. I'm not a gym doctor. But I am a psychiatrist, so let me help you from this aspect. And if you want help from that aspect, why don't you call Imam Sons, right? And let's work together to make this happen. And often that approach, a very collaborative approach, works very well. And most often, patients are willing to be on their medications and um, engage in the, the treatment methods we have that are, of course, very, very helpful for, for psychosis in this case. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um you know, validating patients' concerns and, um, and, and referring them to resources that actually would, you know, help with their concerns. It's really wonderful to see that even imams uh, collaborate with you, Dr. Rawad, to, to help in the patient's care. Um, uh, moving on to our next uh, question. Uh, this one is interesting. Um, uh, this individual uh, was wondering about um, how we got to this stage um, in Muslim mental health where there is resistance and stigma, given the historical um, facts that you provided, where um, it sounds like, you know, there was a heritage with that champion for mental mental health. So how, when, how did the shift uh, happen? Mm, that's a, mashallah, needs its own long conversation, mashallah. I'll say that it started with us. It started with us, historically speaking. We, um, in many ways, as we know, we, could, we can blame so many different forces, colonialism, secularism, materialism, and there's so many isms we can literally blame, and they are all part and parcel of the story. But the primary one that I like to focus on that we actually have control over <laughs> at the moment is ourselves. And what I mean by that is our lack of knowledge. I, and I put myself here at the very start of this conversation, when I entered into the field, I told you I was very skeptical of everything called psychiatry, and I ended up in the field in a very roundabout way. It was not what I intended when I went into medical school to do, and not certainly not until the very, very end of my, my training that I even, subhanAllah, shifted into psychiatry, but the, um, <laughs> different, different story for a different day, mashallah, but um, one of the very first things I did is say, well, what does Islam have to say about this? What do our scholars and heritage have to say about this? And that led to actually what founded my lab at Stanford was that very question and all of the pulling of these primary historical texts on, because growing up, I had heard about all these advancements in nerve surgery and medicine and you know uh, humanities and so on, sciences, we heard nothing about mental health. And part of that is our own doing to ourselves, like not knowing our own heritage. And, some, and now, alhamdulillah, through the work that's been published at the lab and others that have been writing about this for some time now, um, I still find people in the field are still not familiar with it, despite you know, some good work uh, kind of changing that narrative. Um, so I, I start with us first. Familiarize yourself first. Familiarize yourself with the tradition itself. If you know and understand that holistic mind-body-soul connection of Islam, then certainly the mind, body, and so on, none of those are going to be neglected at the expense of the other. And with the different forces that came into our countries and our um, 
civilizations on, you know, especially colonial and secular forces, so much of the backwards ideas, particularly from the European West, that came into uh, that they had on mental health, you know, that were, were very uh, unfortunately backwards that came into our spaces, also kind of really messed with our own heritage and traditions that we had that were quite progressive in comparison. And this is true, by the way, not just of mental health, but of many things, whether it's women's rights or other things, I mean, we could talk about this all day long, that literally we took us backwards by thinking that other, um, you know, uh, non-holistic ways and non-certainly scriptural and regulatory ways were more advanced than our own. So we, we, it's a mind shift. People talk about, you know, decolonizing our minds, literally, that's some of the shift that needs to happen here. Um, but yes, not only is it, but I should assure you that there is a very strong revival movement happening at the moment, and I hope you'll be part of that conversation. Inshallah, Inshallah. we certainly have a lot of work to do to accomplish this. Um, for our next uh, question, one of our uh, audience members were uh, wondering about the methods and procedures for art therapy and sound therapy that you mentioned in your talk, um, if you could kindly provide resources for these therapies. Yes, I would. Inshallah, inshallah very soon you'll have some resources. We're working on some papers now um, that are uh, specific. We had a whole, inshallah, uh, a couple of members of our team who have spent um, a good bit of time in the libraries of Istanbul <laughs> pulling forth kind of music therapy, uh, uh, sound or music therapy. I mean, I say both because sometimes instruments are used and other times it sound like Quran or Adhan or the Maqam, which are the intonations for music, um, and, uh, and, and, and customized to mental health conditions. So, um, and then there, of course, what needs to happen now is more kind of empirical testing of all of these um, in the modern modern sense. Um, but a lot of the inspirations of the field of music therapy actually comes from those origins. So anyway, we have a lot, a long, um, a lot to share with you. Uh, the, so how do you, how do you uh, continue to follow this? Make sure that you're following the law. We can put in the, in the box here some of the handles um, if the organizers don't mind um, for the lab. We're very active on social media. For example, we put a lot of um, uh, 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 you know, re of our research kind of out there, and also to be, and I put the handle here um, in the chat, and a lot of the um, research we put into kind of bite-sized pieces for people to kind of follow uh, as well. Uh, there is there is also, you know, whether it's using art, like color or aroma or sound, all of these were really uh, quite advanced. Oops, it, the, excuse me, the Maristan one is uh, incorrect. It's actually Maristan underscore org. The reason I give you these handles and these websites is so that you're able to follow along with um, uh, the research we're doing. Much of it's in progress and, uh, and uh, hopefully in time, we'll be able to kind of see very uh, uh, access the, the exact resources we're referring to. At the moment, we're literally still writing, writing all this out. So, um, in time is what I'll say with your duas and your support, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Um, for our next question, um, one of our audience members was wondering about insights into how to reconcile traditional approaches, which are often less associated with evidence with modern medicine and how our mindsets may be, may be framed. Say this again, the question again. So it's, um, they are curious about insights into how to reconcile traditional approaches, which are often less associated with, uh -huh. I suppose, evidence-based medicine, essentially, with right. modern medicine. Yeah. 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 That's a great question. And this is also one of the questions, like the one before it, of we have a lot of work still to do. Um, I want to tell you that we're not alone in this in this story. There's actually a good bit of efforts uh, today. The whole entire field called integrative medicine is actually doing a lot of this work already, trying to bring in what with it what used to be called or often are referred to in the medical field as alternative treatments. And I put that in air quotes because <laughs> because. Um, you know, why are they even called alternative treatments if actually they're very, could be very useful. It's, it's a matter of testing, right? Kind of empirically, a matter of um, uh, having enough reason, kind of that it reaches, reaches a critical mass of um, acceptance within the field, right? And you'll see that even when that happens, you'll find that at least um, on the US side, we, we use insurance, I realize you all in Canada may not push all of it on, uh, for everything, but for us, even physical care, we use insurance for, and, um, and now, and the real marker is if it finally reaches a point where insurance covers it, 
So you find today, for example, you know, a person is able to get acupuncture covered for them. Why did we reach that point? Used, for years, acupuncture was alternative medicine, right? But eventually reached a critical mass and evidence-based practice that this is actually useful. So now insurance companies literally cover acupuncture. Our own field, talk therapy was something that insurance companies didn't cover either, right? It was kind of like, what is this hocus pocus stuff, right? But now it's been proven that this actually has uh, that. So, so I guess part of what I'm saying is a larger picture here of in time, in time, I think you're going to find that a lot of these traditional practices with enough uh, resources and enough testing, which also means funding, to be able to test all of this and um, input it into the field, you're going to find a lot of it more reaching critical mass. Look at something like meditation, yoga, even non-psychiatric, non-psychological um, phys you know, physicians literally prescribe these because they've reached a critical mass of acceptance with evidence base. Same thing has to happen with some of the practices we're referring to. In time and children. In time and children, absolutely. Um, we certainly don't have um, a lot of research work that has been done in these type of methods to really sort of demonstrate their evidence. Um, this is why we have a lab. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> why do we have a lab? Why, why, why this, you know, go through this headache of having a lab? This is why we have a lab. Yeah. And I hope, yeah. inshallah, in time, we have the backing to, to do so much of this research we're referring to. Inshallah. I think we have time for just one more question. And I think given sure. the research topic, if this individual was interested in um, asking about, um, you know, really what more there needs to be done. So um, going back to this question. So this individual says that they are um, uh, they're counseling psychology PhD students, um, and they're doing. They're interested in doing research in Muslim mental health and Islamic psychology. Um, so their question is, where do you think the field of research needs to go in this field? Where do I think their our research needs to go, or their research? Uh, I suppose um, more kind of to destigmatizing mental health uh, in Muslim populations. Um, what needs more to be done? Sure. So future work. Oh, this is a great segue actually to something I, I thought, you know, I, I really hope to have spoken. So thank you for the person who's asking. When you look at different stigma, um, stigma within the Muslim community about mental health, there are so many taboo and hush hush topics that are not being willing to, that, that so many of our community members are not willing to address. I'm starting to see a shift, particularly with, you know, I would say younger generations, certainly, but even with people who are becoming more attuned to the idea of things like depression and anxiety and speaking about emotions, you're finding not just our celebrities and our athletes speaking about this, but now even our imams and our Muslim community leaders saying things like, I go to therapy, right, kind of being open about it. I think that some of the more stigmatized topic for the person asking, where do we need to go from here, are, are looking at some of the more stigmatized topics. So I'll share with you in the lab where, where we are going from here. Of course, we have our historical lines and our sonic psychology lines, which are very active, alhamdulillah, and continue to pull out just gems. But there are other lines of research that we're very heavily focused in our lab that I do think uh, talk about stigma busting, right, and really bringing in very, what I call the taboo within the taboo, right? For me, is the topic of, and I'm going to give a trigger warning here, but for those who've been following our work for this last, especially this last year, I've been... Uh, um, publishing and writing and speaking very heavily on the topic of suicide, right? A taboo within the taboo. People don't want to talk about this. Yet our recent publication in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association this past summer, show that the suicide attempts of American Muslims were higher and in some cases twice as high as other faith and non-faith groups. This is a public health crisis, right, in our communities, but people don't want to talk about this. So I'll share just very quickly, and I hope, inshallah, maybe later in your conference today, you'll see our little a promo video of a campaign we're running for next, uh, Marisan is running for 2022 on training at least 500 imams or more uh, and community leaders, Muslim community leaders on the topic of suicide response. So we've created the manuals in our lab at Kandida and now created training modules similar like the what you saw here, but they're think about it on the topic of suicide, a training certification for imams. It's like an eight hour full day certification, inshallah, on this very topic because it is so tough. The next one after that I'll share briefly is on substance abuse. Yet another topic within our communities that people don't want to touch and address. They don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole, but it's very much the case in our community. So people ask, what are future directions of research and work that has to happen to destigmatize? Well, part of it is understanding, getting a pulse on where are we at? 
is this an issue? Are we anecdotally, clinically, I knew that suicide was an issue, but didn't know the extent of it until we did the actual research, you see? And same with substance abuse and same with other aspects. So inshallah, I'll continue to look at the lines of research in the lab and the studies we're currently doing and take a look and continue to follow that so that you either can be part of the journey and I hope you'll collaborate, but certainly if not, then at least you also are aware um, of future directions of where probably this work needs to go to continue to destigmatize mental health uh, within these communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Awad. Um, you are truly an essential member of our community. May Allah reward you for all your work. Um, so this uh, marks the ending of our session. Thank you for your time. Um, I, 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 <laughs> Take good care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.